Hello. So, first of all, hope you're having a good Sunday. Secondly, I am sorry it's taken me so long to get the Long Patrol finished and put up this week. As some of you may know, we've had, due to setting up the offices and getting electricity out there, etc., uh, we've had to have a new boards fitted and all sorts of things, which has meant that we had three days without power this week. And of course, no power equals no internet or Wi-Fi or computers or anything really running. So that kind of knocked things out. And then, well, I have teaching work. So sadly enough, when you have the crunch hours come down, then the hours to come out, teaching work has to be done those hours. So then the hours that need to be made up, they come out of, well, sleeping time, which possibly explains this week's particularly excessive consumption of iron brew, and unfortunately, passion projects. YouTube, I still consider very much a passion project. I love it. It's a lot of fun. But, uh, I've got a level to go before it becomes, um, well, before I can sort of say it's my, it's a profession. Although, that would be kind of fun. But it's only if I get as cool a range of t-shirts to Drac has, but we'll, we'll have a talk about that. Leaving that to one side. Leaving t-shirts to one side. So, today's topic is, of course, the continuation of... Naval History Live Part 2, and Part 3 will also, hopefully, if everything goes to plan, also come out and get recorded today. I'm going to time this to come out when I normally start brew ships. And the reason I'm doing that is because I will be doing brew ships today, it will just be running slightly later. The reason it will be running slightly later is possibly it might all get moved back if it gets rained off. Is I'm plan is I'm planning on doing a lot of work in the garden to try and finish off sections of the office which actually haven't been done by the builders. So um, I'm turning roofing specialist and wall builder today. Always fun when I finally get to do the building myself. Anyway. Leaving that all to one side, that's all sort of the admin stuff taken out. Let's get into the interesting stuff. The interesting stuff, of course, is the Greenwich Naval College, or the Greenwich Naval Hospital, as it was originally done. It's originally like Chelsea. It's for retired naval service personnel. It reflects Britain as the greatest maritime power in the world at its time. You know, that's what they're marketing themselves as. They're not really, but they're marketing themselves as. It's founded by Queen Mary of William and Mary, and Christopher Wren is technically in charge of building it and does it for free because it's so, such an important project. But reality is, um, he goes off and does the ones with he does the sort of the bare bones design, and then his um, assistant Nicholas Hawksmore takes over the vast majority of the rest because. Well, Ren's busy with paid assignments. So it's kind of like the academic structure then at that time, in that the professors get all the high-profile appointments, but the people who actually do the work depends on whether this is going to generate money or it's a voluntary one, because if it's a voluntary one, then the professor will nominate someone lower down the totem pole who will have to do the work. If it is a very high-profile paid one and there's a lot of money involved, then usually the professor does that. Wow, that sounds cynical, but it's true. The Great Hall is fantastic, though. It's one of those really, really lovely things to go through. It's painted by Sir James Thornhill, and he uses so many different techniques, including trompe l'oeil, or trick the eye, and chicarso, the contrast of light and dark to try and make this painting come to life. And okay, one of the things I have always wanted to visit, but I haven't managed to visit, is the Sistine Chapel. Mainly because I can imagine it's the only thing which 
I can consider on a scale comparable to this. In that walking underneath this is like walking into history. I... It's not the history of, you know, oh, we will never surrender, all those sort of things. It's responsibility, the history of responsibility. This is this is the world, and the world rests on you, the Navy. That's what it's like. And it's inspiring and scary in equal measures walking underneath it, because if you think like that, you're sitting there going, Oh, and the trouble is you can't lie down on the floor and look up at it because the attendants don't like that. Um, no, they don't, sadly. But it is really, really cool. Plus other people look at you funny if you do that. Sad. Uh, but, you know, it's absolutely amazing. And you sort of come up the stairs and... As you come to the stairs, you can see more and more, and then you look forward, and you are looking into that chamber. And by the way, that's not a framed painting at the end. If you've never been there, that is a decorated arch, and then there is another smaller room beyond, sort of the high table area. And it's just... It's fantastic. It's... You know, it, it's opulent, but not in a way which is going, yeah, we got a lot of bling, flashy, yeah, no, that sort of thing. Um, I'm wearing a two dozen pieces of jewellery on one hand, so much I can barely move my fingers. It's in a, we have power kind of way. It is, it is made in a time when, honestly, Britain doesn't have that, but it's about what it does, uh, it, it it aims to be. It doesn't aim to be the new kid on the block. I'm showing off everything. Look how cool I am. It aims to be timeless power. It aims to be a timeless certainty, an eternal certainty. And it really is inspiring. This is a sort of another picture, and I've got some details about Sir James Fawnhall there. He spent 19 years planning and painting the Painted Hall. 19 years. And was paid one pound for every yard. And three pounds for the, ce uh, for the ce uh, per yard on the ceiling. So total of 19 years work for £6,685. Now, I have done some rough calculations of this one. And I say rough because I was sort of going, hang on, that's 600, that's 6,000, so that's... Wow, well, that, 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 that's got to be £300 a year, 300 and what? Thirty pounds a year. Well, that's twenty. And that's divided by twenty, though. So three hundred thirty-four pounds a year would be sort of by twenty pounds a year over twenty years. But it's nineteen years, so it works out a little bit more. Um, it works out at roughly three hundred forty-five pounds, three hundred forty-six pounds a year, give or take. Some pennies and farthings. And shillings, probably. Which isn't... Sounds terrible to our ears, but actually is quite a lot of money at the time. And he was able to do other commissions at the time as well, but this is really is a masterpiece. And it is an amazing piece of work. And you can see more clearly in this picture that that is an arch. And it really does guide you through, because you, you you pass through all this under everything, and then you go into there, and it's sort of... <sighs> okay, if there was 
a sort of, I don't know, a church, a chapel of British maritime power, this would be it. That's the closest I can really describe it to you as you are going, you sort of feel almost like you're going into the Holy of Holies in terms of spaces. It is like that. Again, if you're going with people, they tend to like you to start uh, to talk with them uh, or not talk too much out loud and not almost take a sound, uh, be talking so much explaining everything that you become a guide group leader without actually leading a guide group. And there are two guide group leaders who are the official guide group leaders sitting there wondering where all their people are and they've lost them all to you. It just, it, 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 it's not liked by the place, okay? It's not liked. Um, and you can really see the tricks of the eye in that. The people do really follow you around the room. It's quite so from every angle they do almost seem to be looking at you and it does it has so much depth. It does look like you're looking up and it goes on forever. Now of course, such a resplendent place couldn't actually be without its own chapel, especially if you're going to have a whole load of retired sailors living there. You need something to try and keep it on the straight and narrow, broadly speaking. This is also a pretty special space. It's, again, understated, but reeks of power. And the whole thing, to me, is not about war war, although it does have all the paintings of that. It's about inspiring the presence mission. Which seems rather strange to think about it, but how do you maintain peace? How do you maintain prosperity? Not by fighting wars. Wars cost money. You maintain peace, you maintain prosperity by deterring conflicts. You do that with two ways. One, by having allies who you train regularly with, so they have a fine understanding of your strengths, you have an understanding of their strengths, so there's mutual respect, so there's unlikely to be a rapid disintegration of alliance leading into war. And they understand that they can rely on you and you can rely on them, which means that your interests are served by making sure each other, ha each other doesn't have too weak a position. I, if you're going for a trade deal or if you're doing any diplomatic agreement with allies, if you are both being sensible, you will seek an outcome which it benefits both parties. Because the stronger both of you are, the stronger your alliance is, the more secure you are. How do you occur conflict with people who aren't friends? Because there are always people who aren't friends. There are some, they will range from people who are neutral, people who just don't give a flying hoot about you because you don't matter to them and people who actively uh, want to displace you or would feel they can make better use of the resources you have under control. Well, in that case, your presence has to be able to inspire in them the idea that actually directly challenging you in a physical sphere is not sensible. How do you do that? Well, one part, you make sure your ship looks efficient. It has to look spotless. It has to look good. 
voila. It has to look high tech and up to date. And if you go into this one, you know, this particular chapel, you will notice it has a beautiful organ, uh, a beautiful thing, uh, organs and all sorts of things in there. It, is, it does look high tech and up to date. The crew will have to be well turned out. Hospitalers, uh, the hospital members did have uniforms. They had to look a certain way. And most of all, and this is important, your crew will be well trained, well drilled, and carry themselves with the confidence and bearing requisite to their station. In fact, if not better, better still, they will carry themselves a confidence and bearing requisite to a station higher than that which they currently occupy. I, your middies will act like lieutenants. Your lieutenants will act like lieutenant commanders. Your, com uh, your lieutenant commanders will act like their commanders. And your commanders will act like their captains. And your captains will act like their admirals. Not in the imperious, you will do what I say way, but in the thoughtful, I am I am confident in my profession. I'm so confident in my profession, you can chuck anything at me and I'll work it out. I, the admiral or the captain will be able to work on the strategic level. Or the geostrategic level of commander will understand what needs to be going on there. And so forth down. The commander will think on the sort of strategic level of their region. The lieutenant commander will be able to examine the tactical level of fighting the whole ship, not just their department, but the whole ship. Now, of course, these days quite often, your ships are commanded by commanders and lieutenant commanders. But that means then that person in that role needs to still be able to assume the level of thinking geostrategically. And so forth down. The ranks might have dropped down, but they still need to ha carry that burden. And carry that responsibility, but most of all carry that aura. That's what this place turned into. Because it started off as a hospital and became an able college. And that's not surprising. And the two lived happily. Have a look at that. The Royal Hospital Chapel, the chapel was built by Thomas Ripley. Um, again, using designs from Christopher Wren. However, the chapel has actually been redesigned because it was gutted by a fire and rebuilt by James Athenian Stewart with um, far more nautical motifs. He, the idea was that nautical motifs would make um, the pensioners feel at home. I have to admit, when I walked in and I was looking at the various motifs around, the, most of the pensioners were not officers. Most of the pensioners, the vast majority, were sailors and chief petty officers. People who'd served a long time before the mast. The motifs, they... Uh, depict more of what I would consider things which an officer uh, with that sort of background and training or a politician would pick up as nautical motifs. And I'm sure most sailors were pretty well read, and let's be honest, the sea has a habit of taking out people who aren't intelligent. So, yeah, they probably had an understanding, but I think it more spoke to the people who funded and paid for it than it did the people who were using it. And, oof, the full college. 
and hospital. And there's even a little picture of me. Uh, as you can see, some of these pictures are the chat are of the Great Hall, and they're of the little sort of space and in that little sort of that space I was talking about inside. This is sort of an entry dome, the one in the far corner, and then the one sort of in between the Great Hall and the dome is that little enclosed space, that little sort of high table area, which is just beautiful. That's me standing next to a paint uh, next to um, Sir Walter Raleigh, I think, from memory, and that's of course Nelson. It's a lovely place to wander around. Um, the person taking those photos was is my girlfriend, who has a far better photographic eye than I do, and also most of the photos I took that day, because, well, you know, most photos I took involved uh, uh, included her, and I, I, I'm careful about putting pictures of my girlfriend on the uh, channel. I follow the Drac rule. I mention her, talk about her, because she is a big part of my life and one and lovely. But uh, putting actual pictures, she wouldn't like that. So the thing that's always interests me is that the city, in many ways, has moved. To the Naval College. The Naval College, the Navy was the foundation of the City of London in so many respects. Its ability to be a global power and a global trading house depended on the, the access the Royal Navy maintained and allowed around the world, on the security it provided for the merchant marine, for the insurance companies, and all these things when they're doing their trade around the world. And now, of course, the city has moved to uh, there. The city is also there, the Docklands area. So, in many ways, things have got closer. To the Naval College. Coincidentally, whilst also the focus on economic power has meant that there have been more and more cuts on naval spending, because the government didn't want to spend money it didn't need to, because, of course, you know, there was any war was going to be a nuclear war, and it was going to be over in five minutes, or 45 minutes, or less than two days. Either way, no point in having reserves, no point in having anything. Which is, at its point, the most interesting thing about going around Naval College, Naval Hospital, and looking at all these things, because it shows people planning for the long term. William and Mary weren't building this to deal with the people from the next five years. Queen Mary wasn't funding this going, you know what? This is going to look after people while I'm alive. No. By the time it was finished, Let's put it this way. Before her death, she commissioned the construction of the Chat Elder Hospital. Before her death, it wasn't completed till long after she died. Twenty years almost to paint the hall alone. This was not short-term thinking. This was we are going to be we are and leading maritime power. We are going to build ourselves up to be the world's greatest maritime power in our world in our time, and we are going to maintain it for centuries. That's our plan. Forever, if we can. This is building for forever. This is all about long-term thinking. This isn't about the veterans of this of the recent wars. It's lovely to have the idea, but it isn't. It's the veterans for the war. It's building for the veterans of the wars to come. This 
beautiful piece of architecture, art, and maritime history, naval history, is not a monument to na just naval power and to a beneficent queen thanking the subjects for fighting the wars on her behalf. It is a monument to long term thinking. To someone going, this will happen. We will have wars. We don't want wars, but we will prepare for them. These days, naval hospitals, they are funding a current project which is going to build one in the UK, but there are a lot of appliances based on the NHS. But again, that was based on the fact that any wars fought would be peacekeeping missions with only a few casualties, or at, mo at most, or it would be a mass nuclear war, in which case everyone would be dead, so it wouldn't matter. The counterinsurgency experience. The overwhelming of some of the facilities like Headley Court, etc. Which did a very good job. And I live not far from Headley Court. And it did an amazing job. All showed the fallacy of that thinking. The short-termism of that thinking. This beauty, this all this collection, it's all about long-term thinking. Which actually got me looking at recent news about finances and, of course, the uh, Robin Hood app and the various GameStop fun, which has all been going on, which, if you're watching this 20 years from now and you don't know what they are, well, then someone has probably wiped Wikipedia, in which case you should probably be worrying about more censorship than, uh, than what I had done in history. Pretty much short selling quite a lot of the financial instruments which make a lot of money for various investment firms these days are very short term. Perhaps one of the reasons why you were doing the longer term thinking and the time of William and Mary in the 17th and 18th centuries. It's because investors expected longer term results. They expected to have to wait longer for a return on investments. They weren't talking about making an investment and thinking we'd pay them back in a day or two days. They were thinking about years. In many ways, their investments were more like a modern mortgage. You're investing in a house. A house you hope will go up in value, but you also hope to pay off the investment, to pay off the debt incurred to make their investment as you go. So you earn money twice over. You earn money from the rising house value. You earn money from paying down the mortgage, the loan. So you have more, you have therefore theoretically a larger return on your initial investment, your initial deposit. Perhaps that's the problem. We no longer think about our country as a longer term investment, as a mortgage, because that is what you're doing. You're investing money so future generations can reap the rewards. That's what this was. Future generations can be inspired by the painting, by, you know, there are still dinners sometimes in there, and they are whew, wonderful. 
very good food. And it's a lovely place to have a conference. Anyone who feels like holding a naval conference and inviting naval historians along. Um, I know two who would be happy to be there. Um, who And I know one who, if someone was prepared to go 50-50 on the flights, would be happy to come travel halfway around the world to be there. It is a lovely place to have a conference. And it's a wonderful thing there, built for future generations. Look around yourself now. When we ask questions about why are armed forces suffering the problems they're currently suffering? Why is our infrastructure suffering the problems it's suffering? Why are we having the problems we're having now in terms of distrust in politics from all sides of the spectrum. I know this is going off, but it's this is sort of inspiring me to say this. I would argue it's because where's the planning for the long term gone? Where's the investment without expecting a reward in your lifetime? Because that's what Queen Mary did. She invested. This was not for her lifetime. She would reap no reward from this. But. Anne would. Came next. The Georges. They would. Victoria. She would. All the monarchs since, all the prime ministers since, all the people since, have reaped the reward for this investment. It's not a five-year return, it's not a ten-year return, it's not even a twenty-year return. This is investment on a hundred, hundred and fifty-year return, infinitive return basis. About as long term as you get. So, anything else I want to add? Really do look at that painting. It is, I'm going to go through now with actually the paintings fully expanded for a couple of uh, certain minutes, you know, just so people can get a full look if they're looking at this on their phone. It's beautiful. By the way, the pictures are all taken from the uh, Royal Hospital and Royal Naval College uh, website advertising materials. So um, that's how I'm why I'm using them. All were taken by my girlfriend, as I said. It's one of the few really good painted ceilings which look as almost as good in daylight as it does by candlelight, but it is supposed to be seen by candlelight. It is supposed to look be look like this. And noticing the details are intricate. And it's making something so big look intricate is a real artistic skill. Now ah, the chapel. Technically called the Chapel of St. Peter and St. Paul. It's, well, The ceiling was designed by the master plasterer John Patworth in what's considered a neoclassical design of squares and octagons, sort of based on the idea of what the Byzantine uh, or 
sometimes the f Middle East and sort of art artistry was going on, it was interpreted as being at the time. And it follows a Wedgwood inspired colour scheme. Good for Wedgwood. There's also the Samuel Green organ in there. Uh, that was cost a thousand pounds in 1798 and is the potentially the largest instrument built by Samuel Green, still in its original position. It has three manuals, and apparently the pipework, which is noted for the purity of tone and rich text and mixture, stop, uh, stops, is still in use to this day. The mahogany case which covers it is a further £500, so you're talking £1,500 to set up the organ in place. And... It has a beautifully decorated altarpiece and pulpit in this as well. It really is a lovely, it's a space to go around. It's, it's a lot of space and a lot of beautiful things going on in there. Uh, you can see the pulpit more clearly in this picture. You can also imagine that it, you had to be quite a fit uh, vicar to get up in that because that's a lot of steps. And there you go. I think that photo might include me wearing jeans, which is a rare one. But you can see the layout of the building, the various museum add-ons that have happened. And London, of course, behind it. My only other piece of advice to really add in is if you are going to the Royal Naval College, do uh, I always suggest go by river taxi, not by Docklands Light Railway, because as much as I love the Dock DLR and I do use it to wander around London and I, I'm very good with the tube network, if you're going to go to the Naval College, you should travel there as the people in the time did would have done, and that would have been along the river. The river was the major artery of movement, the major artery of transportation. Yes, of course, some people were rich enough to have a carriage, and some people would walk, and or Shanksy's pony. But the vast majority, especially if you're of a maritime persuasion, would have gone by river. And therefore, it is nice to arrive by river. The pier is not that far away from there. And go back by river. And as is then those times, you can actually find, well, in my case, iron brew or coke, um, usually on the river taxi. But other people have been, uh, well, colleagues I've taken on there have occasionally found something a little bit stronger. It's a nice trip. So, I hope you enjoyed it. And as I said, brew ships might start a little bit late tonight. I'm going to schedule it back to 7 o'clock from 6. It's only a one-off, and it's because I'm working in the garden. It's now got dry enough. I can go out there and start doing it. So that's what I will be going to do. <sighs> it's 11.30 now. Bang. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And if it starts, if it rains again, I'll do part three. If it doesn't rain again, part three, I'm afraid, will be done tomorrow. I do apologize for this. As I said, it has been a bit of a random week. Thank you very much. And well, have a nice day and see you later for brew ships. Or if you're looking because you don't know which brew ships comes with this because this is, you're watching this later one, it'll be brew ships. 35? Yes, Bruce Ships 35. Whew. Fun times. Okay, thank you.